really in the last argument, it's about agency and reasoning, and who has the authority to make reasonings about how we should run our economy, and our political economy. And Andrew Sayer has the concept of the foothills and mountains of moral reasoning, which is very interesting, because each of us, from our little place where we are, can easily make give advice about the economy. That might be called a foothill of moral reasoning. But in academia, we expect ourselves to reach a much higher plane of overview, or meta-analysis, what Rashka calls meta-critique. And it's very interesting to try and do that, and to consider why do we have false theories in this area, in particular, I'll be looking at labor economics, uh, why do we have the competition of theories, which are each divided, instead of some kind of merging. And as I say, it's a very post-disciplinary, holistic approach, which I do like very much. Um, so I, I will be continuing to write those sorts of discussions. But foothills and mountains apply not only to academics and our morality and the morals we put into our stories, but also to people on the ground. So in section four, I'll be giving some empirical material from South India, from the state of Bangladesh, And um, I'm a Telugu speaking person who spent some time in that area in the past. And these are translated materials. But the idea is to insert a, a recognition of the agency of those people and their reasonings into our discussions. And I think that's useful, so I'll be saving time so that I can go through part four. But obviously in part two, I need to provide you with some methodology and some background. And in part three, there will be more theoretical background concerning this complex moral reasoning. And especially that found in the literature on tenancy. So I've chosen tenancy as a, an area to develop as an exemplar, really. Uh, tenants in India sort of um, lie in the middle point of the class spectrum to some extent. I want to go into that in more detail in a moment, but I thought I would introduce you to the area by showing you a small reservoir artificially held by a, a dam here that we're standing on. Here's a man washing, uh, watering and washing cows in the dam. And that is the only water source that's visible for quite a ways, several miles, serving thousands of people and their animals. And there is an electricity <coughs> station in the background of that picture. Um, the other pictures illustrate sheep going along the road alongside a motorbike, a bike, and a bus. The buses often have people on top of them because they're so crowded. And um, there's also a picture there of me on the field work, which people insisted that I take and show. And they really enjoyed having a picture in front of the post office. Now, we had shared a meal in the post office at my behest just before this. In other words, I brought food, and I said, I would like to eat my food at lunchtime, as I typically do. <laughs> and I, I found there was no water. The water could not be provided to me. But I wanted to share water. And unfortunately, the station is affecting the water, groundwater, as has been documented in another book by Mark Harris White, which is uh, also with John Garage and others. It's been very well uh, explained there. But there's an agrarian crisis and a crisis of groundwater. So that's a little bit of context. Further context in this slide and it covers class and gender very briefly. The Indian tendency is that a microcosm of the gender, class, and caste relations in rural India. About 8% of the land is perhaps currently under sharecropping or renting of some kind, and maybe 15% of the rural people. These figures are very, very dubious, <laughs> but that's, that's my best estimate based on the National Sample Survey in India. And in this particular village where I was working, the class of the tenant is not necessarily very far the class of the landlord. But in general, what I've been observing is that sharecropping is going on where the landlord is of a much higher caste and class than the renter. It's not always the case. And within that class picture, which we usually describe at the level of the household, gender relations are easily masked. And it's not a good idea to mask gender relations because so much work is done by women. <laughs> so what do we actually do? When we do class analysis for India, we sometimes accidentally fall into a household level quasi masculinity, a masculinization of the household. But the work is actually very, very uh, strongly feminized, with women do, doing many of the operations. Men do particular operations, and stereotypically, they dominate tasks which are paid very well, two to three times as much as what women earn, especially if they work with the bullock labor. But women do most of the work to support the bullock survival. So there's a really interesting gender angle to the wage paradox that Barbara Harris has also written about in another book, India Working. In this book, she describes this paradox where people's real wage, wages per day have risen. The people's annual wage earnings for the poor who are workers on the land have not risen. And this, this is a real crisis of poverty for these rural people, giving value to my 
presentation of a sort of micro study from the local area. Can you just clarify quickly people's yeah. real wage in the, in the day? It's okay. Is it? Well, it, all, all labor by the work is generally conducted either on a piece or a day rate. Yeah. And so there's, there's very little employment of yeah, because the number of days that they can get work has gone down. So I'm in the village. All the women are busy. The men, some men are sitting there. Oh, you see how we're all employed today. We only have, we only have work when the rain has come. The rain is only coming between, it's about between eight inches and 19 inches per year in this area. Maybe eight days of rain. And they work with the bullocks on the wetland to do the plowing. Then, having done that, the women can take over. And um, then again, harvest time, the men are involved. But in between, they complain of unemployment. Employment. And that's what I mean with the wage time number of days of work is, is rather long and, and hasn't risen that much. Uh, that, I mean, that's contestable and needs to be looked at. But the methodology that I'm using here is a very deliberate triangulation, a construction of quantitative and qualitative data about structures and institutions and so on. And I've used local questionnaires, local interviews, and we're currently revisiting families who we randomly sampled in 1995. We're trying to show an awareness of the depth of people's commitments and their interpenetrated existence as members of the household, of the couple, if they're married, of their class, and the caste, and the subcaste. And we're trying to set up the research in order to display what they may have, it's a hypothesis, they may have as a sense of agency. In other words, to make it an empirical question about their agency in the labor market. So my initial hypotheses to explore were, do people choose their tenancy relations? Choice being a buzzword from the neoclassical literature. Uh, and the decisions they make in that setting? Or do constraints bind people? And if so, is that an adequate analysis of social class and caste factors? It seems very inadequate to perceive our Marxist structuralism purely as a matter of constraints. But I, I had those as my initial hypotheses. What mixture of these two things uh, are actually applied by people in the scene? And so, for example, should we see this as the co-presence of choice and constraint? Would that be sufficient to and give us a, a pluralist explanation. Or is there some kind of a dynamic between choice, constraint, and perhaps bargaining, as suggested by uh, Pina Agarwal, who's a Marxist, who not a feminist, and sometimes can play the game of the neoclassical argument <coughs> about rational decision making. I found so far very little evidence in qualitative data for bargaining. So for bargaining arguments, we need different kinds of evidence. Now I want to give a bit more background about caste and class just so that you'll see that this particular village mainly has sharecroppers. It has very little cash rentals at the moment, and that is due to drought, ongoing three-year persistent shortage of water. Not necessarily rainfall, but groundwater. Uh, so the, the caste structure has redis as a big group of castes, and the translation of that could be farmer. Redis are usually farmers by occupation. But within the redis, we have so many who are vegetarian, and so many others who are non-vegetarian. And this indicates and is a symptom of subcaste divisions, or, or perhaps just the labeling of a whole bunch of castes as ladies, because they're only men and they're landowners. And it's very interesting to inquire about this. A few landlords, excuse me, a few tenants would be called as ladies, but not very many. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we do have a lot of Muslim tenants. The Muslims here are a local minority group, and all the Muslims are tenants for your, in legendary time. At the moment, just a few of those have survived as tenants. But many of the Muslims have non-agricultural jobs, and it is the men of Muslim families who get non-agricultural jobs. And they still may do the work of tenant, but they're combining two sources of income. 22% of the tenants in 1995 were Dali, a word referring to those of the scheduled caste, as they're called, by the government of India. And the, the poorest and most um, oppressed of the groups of caste. And Dalis include many castes, such as Mala, Mariga, in this area. And so there are people of that caste who are tenants approximately in proportion to their uh, place in the caste structure. But among the backward caste, which is higher, is in the Hindu hierarchy, backward is higher than Dali and lower than what we call other or so-called forward caste. And so it's, it's, a, it's a complex story to tell you about caste, but I wanted to get you a picture of the way of someone in the middle of the income distribution is renting land from someone higher, basically, in this particular area. That's not the case go to a wetter area. There may be reverse tendency, there may be all kinds of variation. When we look at class and caste, they do map on quite closely to each other, as Barbara said, uh, but 94% of all the landlords and supervisors 
class households come from the poorer caste, such as Brahmin, Vaishya, which means merchant, or Reddy. Reddy's being much more prominent. I'm sorry, there's an error. This is 25, she'd read 44. So from 44 landlord households, or supervisor households, who don't do, they, they watch. They say they watch agricultural labor, they don't do it. And watching is a form of doing, but the words are very closely related in Telugu. Uh, it means they don't get their hands dirty. And out of those, 15 rented land out. So it's an active uh, land market. And um, <coughs> it's just another note there about the background. So 30% of the people are in the very poor dynamic group. Now we've been doing this study, I've been using interviews, and we've, I've been revisiting these villages and the people in them. I've also had colleagues there in the villages, and I have a PhD student now living in the village. So he's facilitating some of the interviewing. It's been very difficult. There's a shortage of uh, very skilled labor. Those with master's degrees don't want to go and sit in the village and do interviews. And so it's been really very hard for us to organize the research. Having obtained 10 interviews at this stage and planning to conduct 35 altogether, we've been using NVivo software to code them up and just help us to organize the research. And so on the left here, we have the a priori themes of research, which form codes. And you do find choice and constraints, quite strong themes in what people say. I'm going to show you some illustrations. <laughs> and on the, on the right hand side are at the top some structuralist codes. So I'm obviously including a post structuralist methodology along with a very strong structuralist you know, dialectical theory. And these would include coding people's talk for their class, their class, their gender, uh, their age group, verbal status, etc. But finally, at the, on, the, on the right hand side also, we also use an inductive stage of analysis, and that's the stage I'm at now to find out what I can learn from the interviews that I didn't know before about how the labor market works for these people who are working as tenants. Well, it's got very, very interesting. So I've come now to my intervening section of literature review on tenancy and the complex moral reasoning in that, in that particular area of literature. And there's a big literature. I have a reading list there of about five pages. Really fascinating. Because it illustrates the use of complex moral reasoning by the authors. And typically, an economist might use great optimality reasoning. Marxists might use development through growth reason, as we've kind of heard, I think, in the new uh, Sen uses human capability to reasoning, and one important Marxist uh, also took that up with uh, I like transformative reasoning. So transformative reasoning is a Marxist transformative model of social action. Capitalism wrote in this vein. Romania, uh, political economy of poverty. There's actually been a rediscovery of this reasoning several times in several different literatures. So that's, that's really where I'm probably going to place myself. But in the tenancy literature, you get a merger of India between some Marxists, thank you, some Marxists, and some very right-wing authors. And this merger occurs because people say tenancy is more efficient than wasting the land through absentee landlordism, or wasting the land through just leaving it fallow. And so therefore, tenancy is good. Lending money to tenants would be better than not than ignoring them. And in West Bengal, we have the theme that giving more rights to tenants would allow them to do farming better. But there's an assumption there that development through growth would be good for tenants and that it would work. Now that we're beginning to question whether development through growth would work because of the limitations of the natural uh, area as we use it. Uh, I mean, the forests nearby are all being deforested and that's causing less rain to actually hit these hillsides. And with less rain, the groundwater problem would be worse and they're pumping it all so we have to question whether economic growth in the area through agricultural intensification is really a good strategy. But, just quick, see that was section three, very rapidly passed over. And I come to some particular micro findings. Each of these people that I'm going to talk to were also interviewed or had a survey questionnaire in 1995. And they're being you know, coded up and looked at. And we can browse and re-examine what they said during their interview. It's a semi-structured interview about one hour in the language, but I've only so far seen the transcripts in English. So I'm, I'm sorry, I won't be able to give you Telugu words for these words that I see in English, and that's the limitation that we'll get over. So I want to present you Ishwarama. Ishwarama here has three quotations, okay? And then I'll be finishing my presentation. And Ishwarama contradicts herself during her interview. So that's interesting, epistemologically. It means that we have to be careful how we interpret what she says. The first thing that she's asked about early in the interview is, what unpaid labor do you do 
for the landlord. Do you do regular on paperwork? Well, that's a long list. She says she does, she brings grass for their cow, she waters their animal, she watches their fields, and they water their gardens. That would be perhaps a mango garden or some tomatoes. After the harvest, we take the fodder. She's saying we get that for ourselves, the leaves from all the, <coughs> the, uh, the rice or the peanuts. But the landlord asks us also to provide fodder to his cow. Then we oblige, and we give fodder to his cow. So she's saying they kind of give a gift if they're asked to give a gift. And it's, there's no money in exchange. Um, but we do not, but we cut coconuts from the tree, but we do not clean his house and wash dishes. Now there's a small literature on this unpaid labor. B.K. Ramachand wrote a book on freedom, which said that they are forced to give this labor, and you know, through the relationship of oppression, they are not in a position to say no, and so they're not paid for it. Um, uh, Doug Wartz and Becca Teshman have also documented, as a number of people have. And by saying she doesn't clean his house and she doesn't wash his dishes, she's saying that there are boundaries to the kind of unpaid work she's willing to do. Now, why do you do this work? Ishwarama says, out of obligation and some kind of fear, we accept the word, and sometimes they give us money. Give, this give is a donation, a kindness, a charity. Uh, if we refuse to do this work, he may not give out his land for rental, or it means rental for us. We are doing cultivation in his land and sharing half and half harvest, so we do the work. They have to do all that and give up half the property to, to remain as the tenant. Now, her relations with other employers are very interesting. She says, uh, sometimes we do not go and do coolie work, that means daily paid wage work, for a person who ill treats us. Please explain clear, clearly my friend, I'm just going this is her. She says, I go for work to this particular person, coolie means work for daily pay. That landlady never allows us to take rest, even for 10 minutes. She calls us for work at 8 30 in the morning. Actually, we it means normally go for coolie work at 9 a.m. She even does not put sufficient curry in our lunch. So it's a dry bowl of rice with very little dal. It's not nice. We keep all these things in mind, and if the same person calls for work next time, we do not say no directly. We simply say that we have another work to attend to. So we do not come. On that day, we go and fetch fodder for our cattle. That means she's out the house. She won't be seen to be sitting in the house <laughs> and actually available for work. If they are generous and kind towards us, we shall go and do coolie work for them wholeheartedly. And what happens in my coding of the data, my analysis of 40 pages of data, is I, I'm coding a number of very value-laden words, strongly, strong moral overtones, if you like, um, kindness, generosity, wholeheartedly, affect. They're affective words, actually, that she's using. And she's saying she values having a relationship of mutual respect. And that is stressed also in the next slide. At times, your decision may be correct, and the landlord's decision is incorrect about the crop, about which crop to put in a particular crop, sugar or peanuts. Uh, in this situation, what would you like to say? In that case, we simply stay quiet. After some time, he realizes his mistake and gives value to our decision. And she says, yes, it happened before, because we are taking our decision based on our vast experience in cultivation. So our decisions are valuable. And he says, does your landlord respect your decision also? And she turns it around. She says, Yes, we also respect his decision. But these people are seeking, or at least appear to be seeking, a relationship of mutual respect with their employers and their <coughs> and it's difficult to achieve that in the context of such huge imbalances in assets. It's a very, very unequal land distribution. So I'm, I'm leading toward the idea that the quality of the relationships is at the bottom of this slide, is valued in itself. Um, and I've made a few other points. Choice is not ever present and it doesn't exhaust the modes of reasoning used, nor does resource use and efficiency. Uh, I find multiple aims of these actors, and some of them are not just economic. Some of them, I mean, I, I liked Barbara's idea that there was a non-economic sphere that was relevant. It's certainly relevant that they have multiple aims, some of them being for social respect and respectability. Uh, there are advantages to using the SSA framework here. I mean, in 1991, there was a big change in policy, and many people now say India is a liberalized country. And, um, and, and yet, I'm not convinced that that's the right day to say that there was a change in the SSA, because there's been huge amounts of private sector throughout the period of, of strong government before 1991, and there's also a huge public sector even today. So things haven't changed as much as they are said to have changed. But the, the, the dynamics of change in the past involve agents, and agents have changed. And I think that it's quite interesting to look at workers' agency. And I would ask you to think
think about whether somehow in the, in the process of doing all the excellent research at the big level, the macro and MISA level, whether SSA has perhaps been ignoring workers' agency. So in my research then, I'm actually working on the methodology primarily at the moment, trying to work out a triangulated methodology for bringing out local level uh, values. And this is what Sayer calls a, um, a, mo a micro moral economy. He advocates studying moral economy, trying to become better at studying morals and ethics, and not only in ourselves, but understanding the morals and ethics of the people who are studying. And these other, other authors are also working on papers, which we hope will be published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics as a special sub issue, part of the issue on development economics and moral economy. But it's very difficult to get papers accepted in the Cambridge Journal of Economics, so it's still under 